the question is, do we learn from our mistakes, specifically concerned with nature conservation? If you take this female uh, elephant, uh, she knows everything in Taro. If it's dry, she knows exactly where's the, uh, the water holes, and this little calf learns from her. So in nature, there's a lot of things to learn, and they learn. And do we as humans uh, do the same, or do we make the mistakes? So, so if you're a student, you must be two things you must be. You must be curious. Curiosity is a very good virtue. And you must be adventurous. So if you hear about the highest mountain in the world, you go and see it's Mount Everest. And this is the photo from the northern side, from the Tibetan side with, a, with a, this, a Tibetan monastery in the front of it. Okay, then you hear about the biggest tree in the world. And this is General Sherman. It's a big sequoia tree in a, in a redwood forest. So what you do is you go and see it. Then you hear about the biggest flower in the world. This is a Rafalicia flower. It's uh, more than a meter in diameter. It weighs more than 11 kilograms. It's in Indonesia, you go and see it. And then you hear about the most endangered animal in the world. In 1988, the most endangered animal live in that little area there. So you want to go and see it. And what we did is we made a plan to go there. And that's the route we have to take. But the problem in 1988, South Africans were not allowed to travel through Tanzania and Kenya and Uganda because of our political issues in South Africa. So we had to take another route west of Lake Tanganyika, right through the Zaire to the Sudan border. And that is a little bit of this trip I want to show you of, of, of areas that not a lot of people know about. This is in the southern part of uh, the, the Congo, the DRC, Zaire at that stage. It's two game reserves next to each other. You can see this area is the highlands, is the Kundulungu National Park. And that is the lowlands. And that is uh, another uh, park right next to it. They live like in, in twins together. So if you go to this park, the highlands part, you find very big surprises. One of the biggest waterfalls in the world, the Lefoy waterfall. Also surprising, you get uh, uh, Prutias there in the highlands in a place like the Congo. You do not expect it there. If you go to the lowlands uh, area, Upemba, they call that area, you find a lot of elephant, lion, rhino, uh, buffalo, everything. And this photo I took of a sable that I do not know what subspecies it is because the marks in the face was exactly like the giant sables of Angola. But today, all you'll find is birds. This is a, a group of... Uh, wattled cranes, all the elephants are gone, not a single one left, all the lions are gone, all the buffaloes are gone, all the rhinos are gone. I met the person that shot the last rhino and he was very proud of it. So there's nothing now but a few zebra, a few daikat, and they see you, they run away. This is a route we took that was um, a route still in, in, in the 1960s. Uh, and that was our uh, destination is to cut through this. And that's actually on the road. This is the little bridges we have to, had to cross. The bigger bridges, sometimes you get to a bridge like this, you have to camp in front of it, repair it, and then you go over it. Some bridges just collapse when you travel over. You can see our vehicle, we stuck on a collapsed bridge, just trying to get to the other side. But then you see the beautiful areas without the tourists. This is the Lulapa River, the only river that flows out of Lake Tanganyika. And what you do is we waited for a, a ferry to, 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 cross, to cross this river. This river eventually uh, became the Congo River, the second biggest river in the world. And then the surprises. In the middle of the Congo forests, an open area with lakes and people around. A fantastic area to travel through. In the night, the moment you stop to camp, you hear the drums and then suddenly just 10 or 20 minutes later, the people come out of the forest to come and see what you do. They're very friendly and you're always welcome. If you go through little towns and they see you, everybody comes to greet you and say hello. Uh, it's a, it was an incredible experience to, to travel up to find the most endangered animal in the world. The old Belgium home uh, in 1988, this place was already abandoned. Then you travel through the most diabolic roads in the world, I think, is the forested areas in, in, in the Congo forests. It takes you a long time, you need a lot of time to go. If you get out of the forest in the northern art areas, you go in this area they call the mosaic forest. It's forested areas, proper forest trees with these grasslands in between. And as you travel north, the forested areas became smaller and smaller and the grasslands became more and more and eventually 
you reach the area that we wanted to go to. That took us more than three months to get there. So this is what you see. Uh, the Gramba Rafi were in full flood. We couldn't um, uh, cross with our uh, vehicle. So you, have to, you had to, to walk. And there you can see the elephants, the big grass, uh, uh, savannas. This savannas is bigger than the East Africa savannas. Huge, huge, huge areas. First thing, very interesting, the elephants. The elephants is not an African forest elephants. It's also not a savanna elephant. It's a hybrid between the two. You can see they're much smaller. You see the tusks, but you can see the ears is not round like the forest elephant. So it's a hybrid between them. And in the background, you can see the Cachelia africana. That's the sausage trees and all the grassland there. The buffaloes, very interesting, also a hybrid between the forest uh, uh, buffalo. You can see the red in these forests, like uh, in these buffaloes, like the forest uh, buffalo, and also the savannah uh, buffalo. You get the Kurdufun um, giraffe, and that's Francois Deacon, Dr. Francois Deacon. I saw he just uh, uh, joined the class. Uh, they critical endangered these uh, uh, giraffe. Uh, there's less than 50 of them, and you can find them. The only place you can find them is in this area, the Ramba National Park. The lions also very interesting. We used to classify lions according to subspecies, which changed now. But this line is on the border of the Congo line and the West Africa line. The, the Congo line is Azondika. The West African line is the Senegalensis. So this one, I don't know what it is, but it's there. This very special animals. But we, uh, uh, we had a... Um, a means of crossing the Garamba River at that stage, because in, 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 in Garamba, they've got these old Af African elephants that were trained by the Belgians, very old animals, but they still tame, and we could cross the Garamba River easily with these elephants. Incredible animals, uh, and there's a lot of controversy about this uh, tame elephants, but uh, at least uh, we could, could cross the river. And then we start searching for this most endangered animal in the world, and we got it. This is the only photograph I managed to take of a trip of months. You can see there in front is a, a, a female a, a rhino running and a, and a calf just behind in the long grass. And this is the northern white rhino. The most endangered animal in the world at that stage, there were only 24 left in the world. So then our story of the northern white rhino starts. It began in 1903 and, and this story got an end. 19 March 2018, this story of the Northern White Rhino stopped it in. So let's start this story then. In Northern Uganda, you get the Ladu in Clive. This is an area, this is the Lake Albert, and this is the Albert Nile or the White Nile. And this area used to be a very famous uh, hunting area of Europeans about 100 years ago. And Captain Gibbons in 1903 shot the first Northern White Rhino in this Lado in Kleift. Um, and that was the first known case of the Western world uh, know about this uh, Northern White Rhinos. Just after him, Major Paul Cotton, a very interesting guy, also a nature conservationist, he shot in 1908, he shot a second uh, Northern White Rhino. And this is the Rhino in the British Museum. That's exactly that Rhino there that he shot. And the curator of the British Museum, Richard Leidecker, named it Ceratotherium semen cottony. And he said it's a subspecies of the southern white rhino. At that stage, were already hammered in South, uh, southern Africa by hunters. So if you look at this map, you see this is the northern white rhino's range, and this is southern white rhino range. So this rhino, the white rhinos, split about a million years ago. So there are a lot of people that think, and genetic studies also suggest that it's a species, not just a subspecies. Um, and uh, it must be treated as, as this anatomical differences and also biochemical differences between the two, two species. But um, as I say, there's some, so still some controversy about this. Very interesting thing, this major cotton said the following thing in, uh, 2008, I, he said the northern white rhino is in danger of vanishing because it's wasteful um, and unethical, unethical hunter uh, uh, practices. He was already worried about the northern white rhino in, 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 in 1908. Let's start this story in 1960. There's two reasons for that. Uh, I was born in 1960. 
So at that stage, thousands of northern white rice in, uh, in, in, in five different countries. So another reason why we started in 1960 was the creation of the Garamba National Park with a lot of northern white rhino in it. So that was in 1960, literally maybe 100,000 uh, uh, northern white rhinos or more. Then in, uh, in, uh, in 1963, the, the start of the Simba Rebellion uh, broke out. It's a war and a lot of mercenaries uh, helped to get uh, Mobutu Seseku in, in, in control of this, uh, of this country. So in 1963, uh, the Simba Rebellion, at least 1,100 northern white rhinos were killed in Garamba National Park. So in 1972, another 100 rhinos killed in Garamba. That was mainly poachers and that rhinos was used for, uh, especially in the Middle East, for uh, daggers and, uh, and, 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 and the Arabian countries exported, imported those uh, rhinos. And at that same year in 1972, we had a lot of uh, uh, rhinos in captivity. In the Czech Republic, there were nine, and in San Diego Zoo, there were eight. And all these rhinos were, uh, were, were, were caught, uh, especially in Sudan area, and they were all breeding. But by 2009, only four of those rhinos still breed. And the interesting thing is if they, these rhinos stop breeding and they stop breeding because they didn't have more space for them, the females became infertile. So that was a very interesting thing that they noticed at that stage already. So as I said, uh, a thousand rhinos killed in Garama 1972. And then in 1976, only 490 northern one rhinos left in Garama and, and no other place, no other country, um, there were any uh, rhinos left. And then in 1918, only 50 left in the world. Um, and then it is when Fraser and Kaz Smith, this is Kaz Smith and her husband Fraser, he's a South African, she's a Kenyan, they arrived in Garamba National Park. And they, um, uh, what they did, uh, get uh, some rangers uh, 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 together. And it's very interesting when I visited them, they had a problem with weapons and they went over to the Sudan rebels in Sudan and they bought uh, rifles there. But they did a fantastic job on their own name. As I said, they arrived in 1990 and in 1992, Northern White Rhino population grows to, to 32. With a growth rate of 7% a year. So they did a fantastic job. And just something about conservation. If you take this graph, uh, the bottom is the concentration or the population density of rhinos. And that is actually for every, almost all animals. And you've got the population growth on that axis. If you haven't got a lot of animals, they don't grow fast. But you need a critical amount of, of animals on the ground, then they breed uh, maximally or uh, 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 what you want them to do. So if you introduce animals, you need them in this area here, the population density here. So it only was only 7% because the population density was in this area. If they get overpopulated again, the population growth goes down. So all, if you introduced animals, for instance, in South Africa, we introduced black rhino into areas and they, and they didn't breed well initially. And the problem was, we, 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 that's what we did. We, the population density was not high enough. And when they get to this area, they start breeding fast. So that is the photo I took. And so, uh, as I say, uh, they start increasing and everybody was very happy. But then the Congo war broke out, 2003. And everybody knows it. we talked about it last time, the deadliest war in the world after World War II. And 2003, after the Congo war, only four Northern Wine Rose survived. And in 2006, the last sighting of a wild Northern White Rhino ever. It's got extinct just before our eyes. And we know exactly what to do. Nobody did it. Uh, we just watched, everybody watched it, and they got extinct in the wild. This is not the end of our story. For the rest of the story, little Kintia um, in the tale. And this is Mount Kenya, a very nice place to go. You must go and visit it. Everybody go to Kenya, but they don't climb Mount Kenya to Nellian and Batten to very nice rock climbs. This is Mount Nanana. A very nice climb. There's also an ice climb here, the ice window climb that you can climb almost to the top uh, to, uh, to Mount Kenya, but just on the northern side of Mount Kenya. Mount Kenya is just to the left of this photo, is the Old Poyeta Nature Conservation Scene. And you can see all these zebra, Birchill's zebra. And this is also a different zebra you can see there, the gravy zebra. 
And this is family more of the wild asks. And that's the only place that I know that you get an overlap of distribution of the gravy zebra and the virtual zebra. And what you find there is this animal here on the right. You can see that's a normal virtual zebra. And this is a hybrid between the gravy zebra and, uh, and uh, virtual zebra, an enormous animal, an enormous zebra. I don't know if they're fertile. I, nobody can, uh, could tell me if they're fertile. But anyways, this is the story of the northern white rhino. So only four breeding rhinos and zoos left in the world. And on 20 December 2009, they transported these animals to Old Payeta in uh, northern Kenya. Sudan was an old, very small calf. They caught him in Sudan. Uh, he was at that stage almost 35 years old. Sunni, is, he was born in, 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 in Czech Republic. He's other male. Najin, so he was about 20 years old at that stage. Her father, Sudan was a father, and then Fatu that was her daughter. And they transported them to, to, to breed. The, the first thing they did is they put Sudan, the old male with female southern uh, white rhinos, to see if he can breed. And immediately what happened, uh, they challenged him. And the moment they challenged him, he backed off. The rhino, if they want to mate a female, if the female wants to fight with him. And at the moment, he dominates her in the fight they can mate. So a lot of little males that grow up in, in, in zoos, they didn't learn to fight because they learned from the fathers and the older males that bully them uh, uh, in nature, they learn to fight. And the moment they need to, 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 to mate with a female, they can dominate them. And this bull couldn't do that. Also his back legs were gone and so he couldn't breathe. So everything and all hope was on uh, Sunni, this, the, the younger of the two uh, males. I took this photograph of him and I can, can you see his condition is not good. Very difficult to, to do condition score in rhinos. Uh, you can look at the neck, the ribs, and you can see also on these muscles. And just one morning they came there and he was dead. He just died. And they, so they sit with El Sud, uh, Sud, um, Sudan. And on 20 December 2008, he died. So that's the end of the Northern White Rhino. They're all gone. They had only two females left, Najin, and she became infertile. Totally infertile, and also her daughter became infertile. So they can't breed. So it's the end of the Northern White Rhino. They can't breed anymore. Um, what will happen with these rhinos? If a rhino don't breed, they became, their, their uteruses, you can see on the left-hand side, became hyperplastic. Uh, endometriosis, and this is a, a, a histopathology slide of endometriosis. So uh, rhinos need to be pregnant all the time, otherwise the uterus degenerate and they get big, big problems. It's all these rhinos had these problems. If you look at this uterus, this schematic drawing, you what you have is this endometrium is getting thicker. What you need is the endometrium to go away, or you lose it, and then this uh, the the uterus excretes prostaglandin F2 alpha that goes to this area there, this corpus luteum and breaks it and a new cycle starts for a new follicle to form. Because of the problems of the endometrium, this is not happening. So these rhinos do not get, uh, became, uh, uh, they don't get into estrus and they can't breathe and that's the problem. And then this endometrium get overgrowth and eventually get cancerous as well. So that's the reason why these uh, rhinos don't breathe. So what they did is now afterwards is they dissect these ovaries out, they harvest these follicles and they grow these immature eggs into mature eggs. In this area, this is where they are now. They also have got semen from that two bulls that they stored. So this right here from follicles to mature eggs is less than 2%, not very successful. Now they want to go to the next step is to fertilize these eggs, implant them in the rhino, and then see if they can re resurrect the, the northern white rhino. This is too late, not been done before. Uh, this is not where you go. This, they put a lot of money in it instead of saving the rhino before they die. So this is a photo of a northern white rhino. The skulls are a little smaller and more compact. They've got, a, you know, like the black rhino, these folds around the eyes. There's also the teeth formula is different. And also a lot of other things is different. So lessons learn from this northern white rhino uh, the, uh, well, fiasco is if you want to act, you act early enough. Don't act when animals are already in this area. Act uh, in time if you've got still viable populations. And then you put all your effort in this viable population. Forget about these rhinos that walks around infertile. Uh, you can try those, but 
just don't worry about them. Get the population that's still breeding in time. And then a very interesting thing, and uh, rhinos can breed in captivity. And that we know from South Africa. Uh, they breed well. And I can just quickly go through a few principles here. And this is a specific example in, in, in a place like Kronstadt, where we live. Um, if you create the ideal conditions for rhinos, a, a cow can calf every second year. The intercalf period is less than two years. And if you put one bull with nine cows, it's not a problem. You get four calves on average every year. Two females, two bulls as average. So if you look at graph there at time, years, and you take the percentage of growth population growth, this period can be longer. Usually when you've got um, females that's already uh, acclimatized to, 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 to captive breeding, they start breeding immediately after 16 months. If you take them from the wild, it takes about two years. But the first year they breed at 40% of the population. Then of course it goes down because you've got more animals and only these uh, nine cows breeding. And it goes down. And the moment at this moment, at seven to eight years, this, these female calves became uh, fertile uh, as well. And then you need to change the bull. But at eight years, you can sit with 42 uh, rhinos. And at 12 years, you can sit with more than 70 rhinos. So this is possible because it's, 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 it's been done. South African farmers can do this and they can do it very well. So it's unnecessary for a, a species to get extinct like the northern white rhino. Let's see if we learn our lessons uh, uh, that we learn from, uh, from uh, this northern white rhino story. If we go to Sumatra, I'll quickly go through this. It's not Africa. This is Sumatra Island. It's a big island in the northern part. You've got this Lyser uh, forest, big forest. And that's where you can see the forest, beautiful rainforest, some of the oldest rainforest in the world. And there you get now the most endangered mammal or animal in the world, the Sumatra rhino. This is exactly, this rhino is exactly where the northern white rhinos were 30 years ago. Exactly. There's only 30 to 80 left. There's people that say it's nearer to 30 than 80. And it's small fragmented. Only one little population breed. Uh, the rest of these animals just walking alone in the forest. And the females unfertile because of uh, endometrial hyper hyperplasia. There's nine rhinos in captivity and only one, one pair is breeding. Exactly the same as northern white rhino. So did we learn anything? Are we going to get, let them get extinct? Right. Let's just summarize. Wild population, critically low numbers, like the northern white rhinos. They are highly fragmented populations with only one uh, population still breeding. Captive population is not breeding. Females infertile. Same story in northern white rhinos. Exactly the same story. So this is the people, and that's another very important uh, uh, aspect of nature conservation. This is Rudy Putra. They are local Indonesians. This is like in Africa as well. Uh, it's exactly the same thing. Now, everybody wants to tell him how he should look after his animals. He is the man that knows it best. We know him very well. You can ask Franz Odekan. He knows what he's talking. He knows the rhinos. He knows the forest. And with his team, all he needs is the support and the money that he needs from his own government and from the, from the rest of the world. Don't tell him what to do. He knows what to do. Exactly what to do, and everybody knows. Why we're not doing, I don't know. So, northern uh, the Sumatra rhino and big, big problems. And I think we didn't learn our lessons. I quickly want to use another example. That was the rhinos. I would like to just go talk a little bit about lines. A photo of Professor Gert Lambrecht. He used to be a professor in Chemie and now a very, very famous photo photographer. Lions, very important animals to humans. This is a civil, the, 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 uh, um, um, a Roman goddess, and she, the lions is a symbol of a power over nature. So people write lions. This, everybody knows it, and that's the Lubin mens from Germany 40,000 years ago. People already rated lions very important. So they will look after them, you will think. This is the Babylon, uh, the Easter gate. Easter was the, the good goddess uh, that was associated with lions. This is uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, and, and uh, the second uh, palace, and they were associated with lions. And in Babylon, there were a lot of lions. Samson, the story in the Bible, if it's a legend or a story, it doesn't matter. Uh, but in 1200 BC, uh, there were a lot of lions in Palestine. Also in, in Assyria, there's this astronaut bull that is uh, in, in, in Nineveh, his palace. There were a lot of lions in, in, in Syria. This is a very interesting story. Xerxes is about 460 BC. 
He fought with the Peloponnesian oils. He, he took his army to the, the Greek islands to go and fight the Greeks. And his biggest problem was lions killing his camels and uh, oxen. And this is a, a relief on Pasipolis, his palace. Uh, it's a big, big problem. You can read uh, Herodotus how these many lions gave him a lot of problems. There were a lot of lions in Persia. If you go to India, it's very interesting. There's a lot of tiger. Everybody knows the tigers, but they rated the lion more important than the tiger than this drawing out of India. So another thing, if you go to Rome, Julius Caesar, he had games for his, uh, for his uh, citizens and he killed 100 lions to entertain his citizens. Pompey did even better. He killed 600 lions for people uh, to enjoy the games. Commodus, he was the worst one of them all. He, he thought he was an uh, in impersonation of Hercules. Hercules also associated with the lion. That was one of his last tasks to kill a big lion. So a lot of lions at that stage in, in, in Greece and Commodus, uh, 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 he think uh, he's uh, or thought he's an uh, uh, incarnation of Hercules. And he killed 100 lions a day in his games for the people to enjoy. So Rome was a big drain of lions at that stage. So this is the historical distribution of lions in the world. If you look at the Asian line, this is the Asian line, a huge area of Europe, uh, Asia, uh, around the peninsula of, of the, and, and 3000 BC, that's what it looked like. After 3000, BC, all the lines in Europe disappeared, just like this. And then in Syria, 980, those lines disappeared. Palestine, you can see, uh, not a long time ago, about 900 years ago, they disappeared. Not one left. And then, as I say, so, so go on, the, the next lines disappear eventually. This lines uh, appear, and that is an interesting thing. These lines were shot just north of Baghdad, five little, of life, five lines, an old male was shot by a British officer. Uh, uh, in that time. So the only lines left uh, in, in, in India and uh, nothing left uh, of the rest of the place. So what they did in India is they don't play around. Didn't play around. This is a hunting uh, expedition. You can see the royalty in front, all the elephants, and that's what they did. Uh, they're surrounded. You can see these elephants uh, surround these two. This is two tigers, this, with, with hundreds of elephants, uh, and then they killed. And everybody got involved. This is King George V, and there you can see in India after he shot tigers. And also the locals, they just shot these uh, 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 lines in India. Uh, and as I say, in India from 1850 to 1870, lines went from there to there. Can you see that little red dot there? That's all was left of lines. So from there to there, uh, the line story. And as I say, people write lines, so you don't know what they think, where do they stop, uh, what is their uh, mindset. So 3 November 1900, only 11 lines left in Gur National Park. That's all were left. Nothing else of these thousands and thousands of lines. So this man, Nevap Russell Khani, he's a local government of, uh, of, in, in Gujarat in the Gir, and he said, we must start protecting these lines. And he asked this man, Lord Gershon, he was the viceroy uh, in, in India to, to, to start protecting. Very interesting, he actually booked a, a, a hunt to go and hunt lions. And then he realized there's almost no lions left. And then he said, okay, we've stopped lions. We're going to uh, protect them now. And another thing is, this is the Maldari people on the ground where the lions live. And they live with the lions without a problem. Lions were, uh, they, 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 they didn't mind lions catching some of their animals. This is the man we visited. This is a nest. That's where they live. They put all the animals in the night in the nest, uh, surrounded by this wall. Uh, this man was bitten by lions twice. And this is his wife at the bull, and they live in. And you can stay with these people, fantastic people to stay with. So we've got three things that's very important in nature conservation. If you start anywhere else, you're not going to make a, 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 any success. So the first thing, you need strong government action. Central government must back you. Then you need a local government that buys it. Ethiopia, the government decided, in, for instance, to do in, in nature conservation, but the local governments do not buy in it at the moment, and that's, it's not working. And then you need the local population to look uh, after the animals. You have to, this tree is absolutely essential. If you haven't got it, don't even start it. You're going to waste your time. So first thing that happened, the habitat uh, recovered. Second thing that happened is the prey animals started getting more. In the beginning, the lions in Gur caught 90% of their uh, food from domestic animals. Uh, and now it's just the opposite. So you can see how they grow. 
1937, already 150. 2010, 411. That's the first time that I visited, and there were already uh, 97 males, 162 females. This is what they look like, the girl lines, the Indian lines. You can see the very good big dew laps. They also got the skull structure is a bit different. Uh, for instance, the infra orbitus for uh, is two, uh, not one, a little bit different, but it's lines. The males got small mane. And I, th and I think this is not because uh, it is a genetically thing initially. I think it was because of the big males were just hunted at undiscriminate uh, hunting of the big males. So in 2020, there were already 674. And at the moment, there are more than 700. All right, so big thing, habitat first, prey species first, line populations grow, no problem. And everybody said the big problem here is going to be inbreeding. There's no signs. Of problems with uh, inbreeding. Inbreeding is your last problem. Everybody wants it, but it's a, it's a theoretical uh, academic uh, problem. They breed without any problems. There are a lot of other examples. It's not a good thing, but it's not a problem. Breed. If they breed, don't worry about that at all. So let's look at Africa now. Africa is a big place. Uh, you can put China, Europe, India, USA, Argentina in Africa, and there will be space left. It's a huge area. Also, the people in Africa write it. Sekhmet, uh, the Egyptian uh, queen, uh, a goddess associated with the lions. This is the most famous of all the forests. Forest, uh, it is uh, uh, Ramses II. You can see the lion running there with him. So everybody write it. That is the, was the distribution of lions in Africa. And at that stage, uh, everybody divided lions according to uh, subspecies in Pantera Liu Liu, the Barbary lion. That's the area that they are going to. And that was a photo taken in 1893 of the Barbary lion known for its mains. And in 1920, they assumed, assumed they were all gone. And that's a very inter interesting point as well to note. They say it extinct, got extinct in 1920, but in 1960, 45 years later, they, they definitely reliable sightings of these lines uh, as well. So sometimes you think there's no lines and there will be lines. Uh, also the girl lines, they said there were only 11, but this, there were probably about 20 left because it's very difficult to uh, do proper line counts, but then they disappeared, they're gone. This uh, West African line, Senegalensis, that used to be its range. This is what it looked like. And, and at the moment, there's only four places uh, that you can find them. This place here on the, on the left, one is less than 10. This place on the right is less than five. And only this place there, two, there will be pro probably about 100 lines left. So these lines, the West African line, on the brink of extinction. That was a photo taken of one, the last line in one of these reserves. You can see also a dual lamp. Very interesting, but a very thin line, uh, not going to survive very long. Azonica, the Congo line. This is a photo I took in, 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 in Zaire of them. That is what they are. And these areas are very positive uh, when they put these areas up because I don't think they occur in these areas anymore. I've visited this area and this area and I haven't seen any lines and nobody could tell me about these lines. Nubika, the Maasai line, still a lot of them. This is the Bakermat. That is the place where you get most lines in the world at the moment. There's still, this is, this is more than half of the wild lines in the world is in this area. So this is the Sulus Makumi Udzunga area. And you can see the lines. There's plenty of lines there. But again, 2006, this is specific counts, 5,500. 2022, less than 1,500. This lines is probably more because I said this is, this is actual counts. Also, this is the Rua area. This is the Rua National Park, and you've got the three hunting areas around it. Also, a lot of lions and uh, big herds. This is the biggest herds. You can get herds of 40 and more uh, males there, uh, lions there. This is an interesting one as well because you can see the manes. It's very small, young lions. And the young lions mate, and that's a sure sign that they, are, they overhunt the lions. And the big males get shot out in these lions. But also, 2006, only 4,500 left, and in 2022, only less than 1,500, although, as I said, there's specific counts there. So this is um, uh, the Maasai line. Um, uh, that's all that's left of them. Blybergia, you know everything there. That's the Botswana and Namibia lines. As I say, remember, I said Kundulungu and uh, Upemba, those two red dots, it's not there. They got extinct in the last few years. Also, these little areas here in Gola, they're definitely not there. Maybe that one, this is all gone. This is the Kafui, this is northern Botswana, and this is Itosha and the Kaukula. So all these are also very small from when I made these maps. 
the Kruger National Park lions, you can see the one in the Kruger National Park and the one in the Kalari, same subspecies, but this is also a photo of Prof. Gert uh, Lamprecht. So that's what's left of them. Cape Lion, of course, everybody knows this was the last Cape Lion in London Zoo, and the last one seen in the Cape 1850, and in 1865, the last one was shot in Eastern Cape, but that's uh, General Bassett. So the African lions from there to there, and as I say, this is a very uh, uh, positive way to see it because they're much less than that. Lion extinct from 26 African countries. Lion vanished from nine, more than 95% of its historical range. So this is specific lines they, uh, counts that they did. Uh, that's total line counts in Africa. So you can see how it go, uh, is going down. At the moment, 1920, they counted 960, uh, nine, uh, 9,610 lines. It is more than that because this is a specific count. It's probably 15,000, but you can see the trend. Can you see the trend? In, and, and we talk about less than 20 years. That's where they're going, uh, uh, the way lines go. Uh, so there's only uh, 56 wild lion populations left. 23 of these populations were less than 50 lions. 25 populations between 50 and 100, and only six populations of 1,000 lions and, and uh, plus. So what they did in 2016, they divide lions in, in, in different subspecies, only two subspecies now, uh, Pantare leo leo and Pantare leo and this different clades or clans or groups, uh, different uh, genetic uh, makeup as well. That is what they look like, all these fragmented small populations of lions. And then you can see the genetic makeup of the things. But we know now, because of the lions of the girl, we learned the lesson, um, uh, inbreeding is not a problem. Lions can breed, and, and, and you can worry later about it, as long as they can breed. So inbreeding is not the problem. Let's look at a specific small group of lions, and we're almost finished now. Look at the Velge von and Game Reserve, and I use this because there's a well-managed area, uh, and, and you've got people that look after what they, what they want to do, and they want to be a, a, a big five destination, like a lot of other places. So it's a big area. It's uh, 38,000 hectares, and it's fenced, and they worked out. Its ideal population is 15 lions. Uh, lines is not working like that graph that I showed you, where you get a specific density and, and, and population graph. Lines work in pride and they're always working. So you can uh, put a small amount of lines in a big area and they will breed. So in 1998, they put in five lines, and 2004, they were already 34 lines and they had a problem because they had to call them. But then, as I said, they use contraception. Uh, very effective to use contraception in lines. You just give them a dart that falls out, but you could immediately be crops. Uh, uh, immediately, and they did vasectomies on the males. And the, the females just suddenly, uh, when they start mating with this male and she's not getting pregnant, she just ignore them and, 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 and what happened, group structures uh, collapse because of these contraceptions. They, you, you just break up the group cells. It's just a strange thing It's happened. So this is not what happened. And what they do that after that is they, they uh, uh, did euthanasia. And what lines do you uh, uh, euthanize? And they decided to do the, the, the little cups because that is the, 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 the group of lines that usually die in nature. So in October 2015, this is what happened to the line. Became very sick, walked around, these eye problems. And you can see the eyes and the purulent exudate out of the eyes and they got seizures. Uh, and they didn't know what was, it was. And then they identified a canine distemper disease. And in February 2016, 93% of all the lions died. It's, this uh, disease was brought in by dogs. This is uh, the, the virus of the dogs. So if you look at small populations, that's what we're doing. Canine distemper in lions. If you've got Velgefonden, there's an area, uh, this is the size, it's a small area, 23 lions, 22 died when the disease broke out. The same thing happened in the Serengeti. Canine December broke out in lions in Serengeti. A lot of lions died. It's a huge area. The start of the population was 2,500, and there were no effect on the population. So the smaller the population is disastrous for, 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 for diseases. If you've got a big polar population, it's not a problem. Everybody uh, thought it was a big, big problem. There's no effect on the population itself. Another very good example is Kruger National Park with TBR. Initially, everybody worried a lot, uh, but it's the minimum effect on the population size. What actually happened is the old animals died and the population age decreased. That's only only, only thing that happened. And then disaster in Ger, uh, uh, lions start dying and, uh, and they identified uh, canine distemper virus for that. F uh, 34 lions died and the critical number of lions at that stage more than 600 and they survived without uh, a, a disaster. And a very interesting thing you can see here, the lion's mane became bigger and bigger in, 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 in there. 
as time goes on. Uh, we said they hunted out all the big genes for, for Maine, and now you can see it's coming back, and they start vaccinating these animals. So lesson, small populations is genetics. Let's talk about the neck. It is a problem, the uh, diversity and uh, decline in diversity. It's very important for me to keep subspecies. Don't introduce different subspecies in the area. Use just one subspecies. And that's a big problem because, the, for instance, the Apagara Game Reserve in, 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 in Rwanda were populated with Krugeri lions. And uh, also Pilonsberg was uh, populated with Blyberia from Namibia. And that's the problem. Keep the subspecies where they should belong until we work it out. Because the last thing is was not said about subspecies. And then you try to keep the diversity in the subspecies as high as you can. Uh, but genetics, uh, inbreeding is a small problem. At the moment, definitely it is. Southern white rhino is a very good example. Pierre David uh, antelopes is a very good example. The girl lion is a very good example. But disease can be just catastrophic for small populations. So just a little thing, small thing about captive lions in South Africa. You can see where I work. I work with a lot of farmers with captive lions. You can see they feed them very well. These lions are very good condition. They look very well after big spaces. Most of the lion uh, farms very nice. A lot of shade, a lot of water, no problem. But look at these lines carefully. You can see they're overweight. And can you see the big mains? Their selection is not for functionality. They, they select for big, uh, broad uh, skulls and for main, uh, for uh, uh, these main. And that is uh, uh, not right. So that, uh, just a quick thing about captive lines in South Africa, there's between 10 and 12,000 lines in captivity. Almost as many lines as there in, 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 the, in the wild. Genetically, they pollute it. They, uh, they, and that's the big problem. They, they mix up species, say they're useless for nature conservation. You can't reduce them because they totally genetically polluted, of no value for repopulation. So it's not a nature conservation thing at all. Uh, cups removed from mothers at birth, have got a big problem with that. And then what happened with the females? If you get to these farms, it's only males. So the females just disappear somewhere. What is the selection criteria? And then the hunting ethics, uh, we can talk about for hours and hours. So what I want to see is lines like this in the Serengeti young lines, looking over the horizon, big areas, uh, and you don't need to intervene all the time. Don't worry about disease. They are very unwell. Uh, just one last thing about lines. If you look at the cats of the world, you see the tiger. The tiger is there, he catches prey with power. He's a powerful animal. He overwhelms his, uh, his prey with, uh, with, uh, with brute force. You get the cheetah, just the opposite. Uh, they run, they're very fast. They catch their, um, uh, um, their prey because they're so fast. Uh, the, the leopard is sly, he ambushes his animals, uh, his prey animals, and he, and, he, and he catch them that way. Wild dogs is very different again. They work in packs, they've got a system now, they work and, and they work very well together to do that. And lions, it's all those things together. They're brutally strong, they fast, they sly, and they work in, in, in groups together. So lion is a very, very special animal. And uh, there's big problems with lion because we didn't learn our lessons. We're not gonna learn our lessons. And I see we asked this question again, did we learn from our mistakes? And it's a definite no. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. That was so, so interesting. I learned so much today about the different species of, of the animals you were speaking of, of the North, Northern white rhino and the lions and the problems that we're facing um, genetically um, with the loss of population um, because of disease, uh, because of poaching and hunting and that are, our efforts are not making a difference unless we, you know, we address some of the issues that you mentioned. So, for instance, with the Northern White Rhino, early action to prevent such loss in critical low numbers, um, main effort in the viable population, uh, captive rhino breeding, um, and with the and with the lions. Um, I mean, the historical synopsis that you provided was very informative, and I'm sure our 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 participants, uh, especially our students, have learned so much from your talk. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Defoe. We're very grateful uh, for the time you've given us and for such an insightful, uh, wonderful talk. And I'm sure people are itching with questions. Um, and so this is the time for our question and answer session. 
Um, so just a reminder that if you have a question, there's a raise, uh, raise hand function at the bottom of the screen under reactions. So if you click on reactions, you'll see a, a little emoji with a raise hand um, that allows you to raise your hand. So I will pick on you and you can unmute your mic and speak, or you can write your question in the chat box and I, I can read it out for, for Dr. Defoe to hear and answer your question. And our first question actually looks like it's from the class. Welcome, it's so good to see you all. So um, go ahead and ask the question. Speaking into a computer. Yeah. Is it mine? Oh. Um, I was to ask, is there still a role for uh, the international zoo community in the conservation of uh, Africa's large mammals? Uh, yeah, um, for me, it's more important to, uh, I want to say this first, to, to do the conservation in nature. Keep the, because what happened is a lot of these animals learn from what they have to do. I mean, lions hunt different ways. In, 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 in Okavango swamps, they hunt uh, elephants. They learn it from the uh, uh, rest of the group and their mothers. While in a zoo, it's, uh, it is possible and you can do, and there's a lot of things being done in zoos, very good things, but it's not the ideal because you get these different clans. Uh, uh, I mean, if you take a leopard, the, the, the Cape leopard is different from the low felt leopard. They hunt different things. They learn it over years. And if you get animals in a zoo and you reintroduce them, it's a last, last uh, resort because these animals you reintroduced do not know and they didn't learn from the rest of the of the group. If you take the Urung Utans from Indonesia, not in Africa, is they learn things to do. For instance, they built nests in certain areas. And what they did is in areas they reintroduced uh, Urung Utans from, from, from zoos. And these uh, animals, they adapt and they survived, but they didn't build nests the way they did uh, before. So the big thing is to, to, to intervene uh, in nature, while it's still worthwhile conserving the animals that's uh, in that area. Thank you for your question. Um, just a, a note for the students in the class, when you come to the mic, just say your name uh, so we, we can address you. Thank you for the question. We have a question from the chat. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, can I just maybe just say something else as well before we go? Uh, there's a lot of good things happening in zoos. For instance, they, uh, they worked a lot of these reproductive problems of the smarter rhino and also the non-white rhinos out in zoos. So it's a lot of good things. And the education factor is also an uh, important factor. But uh, you know, the latest studies show that people that go to these zoos and especially the good zoos, they think it's all right to keep uh, animals in zoos. But there's also a, a thing out to make out for, for, for instance, uh, for rhino farmers. They did very, they do very well at the moment and conservation of these uh, rhinos. Um, uh, and these rhinos you can reintroduce very easily, but the, the first price is still to look after the animals that uh, is in the area. Thank you. Um, I hope that that was helpful to the person who asked the question and, and to the uh, participants. Um, just a reminder that if you want to receive newsletters uh, from Share Screen Africa, to please look at the link uh, in the chat box and sign up uh, for further newsletters. So you get uh, uh, notifications of the upcoming talks and more information. Um, and our next question is from Marty J from the chat. Thank you, Marty. He says, thanks for the interesting uh, thought provoking talk, Dr. Willem. Do the subspecies interbreed if put into the same area? What do you you get. I know in some species or subspecies, they become infertile. One subspecies interbreed is the only solution to euthanize the crossbred pr progeny. I hope I said that correctly. Progeny. Well, okay, in certain and in subspecies, you can interbreed. Uh, it's species that don't breed. And, and, and in this case, uh, where uh, I showed you something about the gravy zebra and the virtual zebra, those animals are probably infertile. 
But for instance, subspecies in lions, uh, there's only two now, but there used to be a lot, lot more, they can interbreed. Uh, also, giraffes, uh, you must ask uh, uh, Dr. Francois Deacon, he's an expert on that, and he can tell you that they can, subspecies can definitely underbreed. And, and we had a discussion yes, uh, just yesterday about it. Uh, a lot of people think, uh, they, they think about genetics and they need, think about hybrid uh, vigor. If you put two subspecies together, you get, get more hybrid vigor and you get a stronger animal. But in nature, it's not working like that. Your, your, your subspecies, even if in small population, it's not a problem. Uh, they, 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 because they start off with a very broad uh, uh, genetic base, it's not necessary. Inbreeding is not a big problem in, in, in nature. Uh, even, uh, I mean, a lot of people will tell you there's a, a lot of inbreeding in, in cheetahs uh, and, and, and you've got very bad genes. But that was not because of, 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 of small populations. So no, we don't like them to breed uh, inter subspecies and they are fertile and uh, subspecies, they are fertile, but we don't like it. Thank you for that question, Marty Jasper, and thank you for the answer. Uh, we have a question from Richard Mazibedi. I'm gonna ask him, okay, there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Vellum said um, very important points, especially that, that those that relate uh, to, to learning a curricula for, for ecology students. You, you mentioned um, that in the wild, you know, parents teach um, the young ones how to hunt. And um, we, we observe that even in the um, Okavango Delta here in Botswana, such that some lions in the other part are unable to hunt buffaloes while in other parts of the Delta, they are excellent buffalo hunters. And, and I just wanted to reiterate that point. And, and in books, you will meet that uh, concept as a transgenerational geno uh, phenotypic plasticity. That means adaptation through non-genetically um, inherited uh, traits. And that is a very important survival uh, aspect um, that maybe cannot be achieved in zoos, for example, when you introduce. But uh, just to get to my uh, question, but it might be already answered because I heard um, you talking about subspecies crossbreeding, not as a, a good thing in, in the wild because I was gonna to get to the point of what you meant by genetic uh, pollution. And yeah, you may clarify that, but I think I got the hint of what you meant, but you may just want to, you know, clarify. And, and the points you are saying are very good, important points for a meta population management, because these subpopulations a uh, in the they are meta populations and what you said uh, in terms of genetic uh, management is very they have very good implications for meta population management in ecology thank you Yeah, no, I think, uh, thank you very much. That is exactly what I wanted to say, but your English is much better. I think people understand you a lot, uh, lot better, but I don't think I need to say anything. You just, uh, uh, and I know, and I can just, just hear that you understand uh, exactly what's going on with lines. And I can just say another thing here, and that's why I say, this is an African people. Uh, a lot of people from other places wants to tell us what to do, and, 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 and you don't tell them. They know exactly what to do, and this is a very good example. Thank you very much. I don't think, I think you answered everything. Yes, uh, genetic diversity and, 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 and pollution, I mean, if, if, you, if you cross these subspecies, is exactly uh, what you said as well. You need these uh, subpopulations, and they're different, and, and, and maybe in, in, in a thousand years it will be another species. But thank you, no, uh, that is uh, illustrate everything that I said. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for your question, Richard. And thank you for all the questions. These are very insightful and informative, um, especially for me, who uh, this is uh, this isn't really my, uh, my expertise, so I'm learning a lot. Um, just a reminder that for those of you who missed um, part of the talk because uh, you joined late or I'm seeing some time zone issues here in the chat, um, the link is available in the chat for for the uh, for the YouTube uh, on YouTube, sorry, of the recording uh, of the entire talk. So 
you can still go back to it and listen um, when you have a chance. We have another question in the chat before I go back to the, the students in class. Um, the question is from Murphy Tladi, and he and and the question is very interesting talk. Uh, my question is, is there studies that have looked into the behavior difference when the social species populations decline? And what did they find? For example, the elephants can communicate over long distances. So even when in, when in isolation or, or small herd, they might not feel lonely and live less stressful, hence continue breeding successfully, even in the small group. Yeah, it is exactly the same with 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 uh, 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 lions. I mean, uh, we talked about a, a, a lot about lions, and they communicate. I mean, roaring is a is a, is a long distance uh, uh, communication uh, form, and there's a big. I mean, the prize of lion, everybody knows about it. But if you go to to, to rhinos, for instance, um, uh, white rhinos, they've seen in nature uh, sometimes more than twenty rhinos together. So they 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 do communicate, and if you hear them, they communicate at different levels. And um, the black rhinos were always said, you know, that they're not uh, social animals, that they always walk alone. But you know, there's a lot of evidence now that they do get together much re more regular than they thought initially. Uh, I think sister, Siska can also help us there. She worked with a lot of black and white rhinos. So there's a lot of communication. And as I say, that is also part of that graph that I show you. If you've got enough animals and the social structures is, uh, is strong, they breed. Uh, if you transport uh, rhinos, if you just take a rhino, you transport, they stress like hell, you can't believe it. If you take a group that knows each other, it's so much easier. They know each other, they're friends, and it is just so much easier. So you can see these um, things that we do not know a lot about, but group structures is very strong. And if you break it, you've got problems. Thank you for your question. And we have a question from uh, the students in class. Please say your name uh, as you ask the question. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Alex. Um, I just have a question um, regarding the uh, trophy or the recently released uh, hunting quotas in South Africa. So obviously um, hunting plays or has been documented to play an important role in the conservation of uh, South Africa's habitats, but um, what is your views on the recently um, released quotas and do you think it's um, got some sort of agenda outside of the conservation industry? Yeah, very interesting question. And it's, 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 uh, uh, hunting can play a very important role in, in, in nature conservation. In fact, it do. Uh, and it started off a long time ago, if you, if you remember the old uh, uh, um, uh, systems uh, the, uh, um, in, in Rhodesia, the old Rhodesia and then Zimbabwe, uh, they start a, a very successful hunting uh, conservation areas. There's areas that you can't uh, uh, get money out of, of, of tourism or anything else you need to hunt. So a big thing is this, and now you've got this problem of, of people pressing you that really don't know, uh, uh, people that is not in Africa uh, want to tell us how we should do it. So hunting, and there's a lot of sensitive issues around this. Uh, I, what I will do is I say this, hunting is a very important part of nature conservation, no doubt about it. If you go to canned hunting, just to, 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 to open the worm, the can of worms, what can you do with the lions in, in, in South Africa, all the wild, uh, the, the captive breed lions? It's, it, it, they're not u any use for, 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 for nature conservation. It's a very difficult question. Rhinos, uh, I think uh, personally that, for instance, if you can, can, can uh, cut off the horns and sell them and you can put it in, 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 in rhino conservation, you anyways adopt these uh, animals. So why not? So there's a lot of rethinking and uh, the uh, uh, the, the models we have at the moment for nature conservation, especially rhinos, is not working. And also the line uh, nature conservation is not working. But there's definitely problems with line hunting as well. Line hunting in Rua is over hunting. There's no doubt about it. They hunt out uh, the males, they, uh, they, 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 they put out bait and they, they, they get them out of the areas so that it's, it's over hunting. But as I say again, uh, in, in, in certain areas. And another thing that I want to say, what do you think about the hunter that comes to hunt a buffalo in South Africa with a green tag on his left ear and a red tag on his right ear? Uh, what sort of hunter is this? So I've got a lot of problems with this ethics, but there's hunters and hunters. And um, 
Uh, I'm going to say this. I think there's a lot of political issues. I think in the government, they don't understand this at all. And I think that I hope we sorted it out and hunting can definitely play a very, very positive uh, thing in nature conservation. Thank you for your question, Alex. And thank you for that, for that answer. Um, we have another question from Liesl. You're unmuted, you can go ahead. Good afternoon, thank you, Willem. I'm not going to ask you a question. I just want to tell for the broader audience, we're not just 62 participants. Uh, we were about 30 students in our class and Francois Deacon also has a group of the agricultural um, As, as a group and on Friday your lecture of today is going to be part of the assignment of the post of, of these students and um, I mentioned the other day in our department this, the postgraduate students um, created their own new club it's the beer club it stands for um, biodiversity ecology environment and research and some of the talks that we're now going to do on rethinking conservation is also afterwards going to be discussed in our beer club so the the audience is wider and hopefully the message in the end will also be spread out and wider and again thank you for the variety thank you Liesl. thank you oh go ahead uh, if you wanted to comment sorry i just wanted to say something. did you want to uh comment dr Dufa? Oh no, I, 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 I missed something there. <laughs> so was there a specific question? No, she was uh, yes. thanking okay. you no, and no, telling no. you about, no. yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and just to add on what she said, um, as our network continues to grow, this is an opportunity for students alike to meet students from across, uh, across the continent. Um, as I spoke to someone earlier, who mentioned that there's a whole team from East Africa. So take this space, uh, you know, and use it, have fun and network as well. Um, we have another question in the chat, but from Charles Sturton, uh, which reads in rhinos, what is the impact of territory, terri sorry, territoriality for form breeding programs relating to communal, communal neutrality of dunging middens in the wild? I hope I read that uh, clearly. I can read it again, if it wasn't clear. Uh, I think I, I, I understand what he means is that um, what you have is, let me, yeah, there's two, two, two things now here. And, and I think again, uh, uh, the Rhino breeders and Cisco can come in here as well. If you, what happened is they, they, they need a, a minimum amount of space. Uh, there's a lot of uh, reasons why they need a minimum amount of space. For instance, if, if the females uh, want to calf, they want to go alone to a certain area away from the group. In special in white rhinos, the black rhino is not a big problem, then they need that space. Also, uh, we talked about the middens is a place they mark their territory. Uh, there's a definite territory and especially in the males. And, and what's important here as well is the young males uh, need to, 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 to uh, sort of get their territorium and, and that's when they fight with the big males and that's where they learn how to dominate the females when they need to. And sometimes the males kill them because of that. So of course, you've got this big problem. This part of the ecology of the place, they need to be big enough, uh, but not too big. You, you need the critical density of, of, of rhinos in the area. And that's just part of it. Uh, the marking of territory, the, uh, the bull males that dominate, uh, females that uh, associate with different groups. So you need to be big enough, but not too big that they, uh, the density becomes too, 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 too small to breed. So it's a very delicate balance. And it's very interesting, the farmers in, Af in South Africa did get it right because they breed very well. They breed, I mean, they breed very well. Uh, I mean, more than half the world's uh, white rhinos is in, in private uh, uh, ownership in South Africa. So uh, you can just go to these people and they will probably answer this uh, even better than I do. Thank you. And thank you for that question. Um, we have a, a hand raised from Richard again. Uh, feel free uh, to unmute. There you Thank go. you. Yeah, it just um, this. I'm, I'm very intrigued, and and I learned something really important and new and important about lions that the subspecies, um, the the hybrid from the subspecies, is you know not probably not fertile and, and not a good thing to, to, to happen. 
because we often teach students that um, we, we, uh, genetic diversity uh, that results from the interaction of subpopulations is important for what we call a response diversity, you know, such that when they say catastrophe, you know, as you know, at least some of the uh, individuals will survive within a. Now, is this because we have fewer um, subspecies of lions that we discourage the, you know, genetic flow between the subs subspecies? Is, is it, where, where, sorry, one, is, is it established that this hybrid don't reproduce? And two, these are two questions. Two, um, is it uh, only a phenomena, um, you know, maybe restricted to species with very few um, subspecies? Yeah, those are, those are just two questions. Thank you. Okay, the first, yeah, yeah the first thing is, and, um, and that is something that a lot of people do not understand, the genetic diversity. What is genetic diversity in lines? The subspecies do uh, interbreed and they fertile. And that's the problem. Most of the lions in captivity uh, 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 is hybrids. So if you take a place like Botswana, where you come from, it's, 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 it's what you do have is you've got these prides, and sometimes you get these the, the main male lions uh, became big, and, they, and the big males the drive drive them out. And these males migrate very long distances, and they uh, what they do is they keep the biodiversity in the group uh, high. Uh, so what they do is they don't go out of the group at another subspecies. In Botswana, they walk very long distances. You know, they walk from Sotwiti to the, to the swamps and even further. But that's in the subspecies. So you need diversity in the subspecies. But you don't want to, 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 to get two subspecies. Uh, uh, you, you don't cross them. You don't want it. Because it's part of, this is the biggest show on earth. It's speciation. And you, you named it, you said it. So uh, two things, yes, are they fertile subspecies. You don't, uh, there's actually two subspecies, but even the clans or the groups in the subspecies, they don't want you to, to, to cross. But like in Botswana, they walk very long distances. They keep uh, the diversity in the group very high, but they don't cross uh, to, to other subspecies. Thank you for those questions, Richard. Um, we have another question from the class. Hi, I'm Lisa Whitehead, and firstly, I would just like to say thank you very, very much for your interesting talk. Um, so my question is, when, when talking about genetic pollution and um, hybridization between subspecies, is it only behavioral differences that, that, that is the main factor when you, you want to keep them separate, or are there other factors to keep in mind as well? And the main reason is that uh, you lose diversity. Uh, if you take subspecies, uh, uh, what it means eventually is that subspecies will become, in, in many, many years, it will become a species. Uh, uh, if, if the moment you, you, you start crossing these genetics, you lose that subspecies status. And then you sit with the original, uh, you, you go back in time. So the main, main problem is just the, uh, the loss of subspecies. Um, these uh, hybrids do very well. They adapt, you can uh, uh, do, put them back in nature. They do very well. They're strong animals. They're not a problem at all. So if I understand your question correct, it's just to keep subspecies. Uh, uh, at the moment, there's only two. Uh, but these other groups, you, you, you don't want, as I say, if you, uh, I use the uh, example of the leopard, the Cape leopard and, uh, and the Lofeld leopard. It's the same subspecies. It's the same species, the same subspecies, but you don't want to cross them. They're different. One is 35 kilograms, the other one is 65 kilograms. They're different. Although they're the same species, you don't want to cross them because then you lose that special genetic makeup of certain animals. Thank you for that question. Um, we have a few comments um, in, the, in the chat, which I'd like to address. Um, we have a great comment from Lorraine Chitok, um, just about uh, liking and subscribing and commenting um, on the YouTube channel to, to get the video shared more widely. And I think that's important to get 
you know, Dr. Defoe's talk to be shared more widely and to reach a, a larger audience. And there are a lot of people from around the world uh, in the room, from Kenya, from Hungary, uh, Professor Enyang from Nigeria. Thank you, Johan, for those shout outs. Um, yeah, and just thank you to everyone who's joined us. And a special, special thank you to Dr. Defoe for such a wonderful, interesting and informative talk. I'm sure all of us have learned so much. Um, and we had so many people uh, present today. Um, and I'm sure you could see it in the chats uh, and in the participant list and in the class. Um, but you know, before I, I wrap up or, uh, are there any more questions um, from the audience, from the class um, and from those of you who are still, still with us? Thank you. All right, so we don't have any more questions, but thank you so much, Dr. Willem. We are very, very grateful to have you. Um, do you have any closing remarks, uh, Dr. Willem? No, thank you very much for everybody listening. It's all about nature conservation. Thank you. And I see a lot of people there, uh, uh, Ashley from America and all those people, uh, Chris and um, um, uh, from Cape and everything. Uh, yes, we talk about, uh, we'll talk, I'll talk to them later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for everyone joining us. Uh, just a reminder, don't forget that our next talk is on the 20th of April. Um, I'll just share my screen quickly just to show you. Um, I'm sure you can see my screen um, with Dr. Peter Johnston on the 20, 20th of April, uh, same time as today. Uh, one o'clock will be kicking off um, and he'll be speaking about climate change and the importance of it uh, now. And I, I'm sure you can see that with the changing weather patterns um, and you know a lot of environmental catastrophes that are happening because of this. And we're looking forward to this talk and we hope all of you and more people can join us. Uh, so thank you uh, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Tufo, again, for being with us. Um, have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you at our next talk. And if you haven't already, pre please uh, subscribe to the newsletter so that you can get more information.